presence with us today. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you. So, yes, let's uh, open with a word of prayer. We are grateful, oh God, for all you have created, for its majesty and its wonder. And indeed, we come this morning in awe and with great thanksgiving for the diversity of what you have created. And continue to work in our hearts and minds, our creativity, that we might be better stewards of this remarkable gift of creation. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Okay, Brandon, yes, ma'am. Yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, hi everyone. My name is Brandon Huff. I live in Yellow Springs, Ohio, which is a uh, suburb of Dayton, Ohio. So kind of an hour west of Columbus, hour north of Cincinnati. I live with my wife, Dr. Ashley Huff, and uh, you saw one of my children. Uh, that's Hunter, and then our other child is Lark, and she is four weeks old as of yesterday. So she is asleep right now. Um, we are very privileged. Um, we love it here. And so um, I'm a graduate of the Air Force Academy, 2011, and then I got a master's in sports admin at Xavier University, and then a master's in uh, public affairs and nonprofit management at uh, Indiana University. And after serving active duty, I got into race directing. And so I was the Air Force Marathon race director for a few years. And then I had my heart uh, tugged on when I read a book called Nature's Best Hope by a gentleman named Professor Doug Tallamy, who is the co-founder of the organization I am now privileged enough to work for. So a tremendous amount of serendipity to read his book and have it change my life, and then to end up working directly for him. So with that, I'd like to uh, start this conversation. Uh, let me go to screen share here. Uh, here we go. Hopefully you all can see that. Yes. Great, yes. Perfect, and we'll go from the beginning. Um, here we go, okay. So I wanna to talk to you all about the grassroots solution to the biodiversity crises. And that gentleman in the top left, that's Doug Tallamy, um, the professor of entomology at the University of Delaware, one of our two co-founders, the other being Michelle Alfandari, who is an accidental conservationist. She spent her entire career in licensing and marketing and knew nothing about this <laughs> until she ran into Doug at a talk and was so impressed that she said, we need to start an organization. And so they did that four years ago. And so here we go. Um, does anybody in the room know what this bird is? Bob White. Yeah. Oh, that's a good quest. That's good. Let's see here. I'm going to, I filmed this in my backyard two years ago. Wow. Is it loud on your fingers? I think it's a Bob White. Somebody yeah. said a Bob White. Bob White. Yeah. Northern Bob White. So he'll make his call again. They're, they're known, they're named, uh, it's an automatopoeia. They're named for their, their call, Bob White. We can't hear it. Oh, you can't hear it? Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'll go to the next screen. But he makes his call in the video twice. Um, he, I filmed it on my back fence. Um, who knows what this one is? Ooh. Probably never seen it. No. We've probably heard it. It's called a whippoorwill. Oh, okay. oh wow. Whippoorwills. Whippoorwills are in the night jar family. Um, night jars don't usually move it much during the day. They're active at night. They hunt insects at night. So I took this photo two years ago in northern Ohio at a marsh. Um, I got lucky a muskrat had flushed it and he flew right in front of me and re-perched and he would perch like this all day and not move. And so you just have to be lucky. Um, but that's a whippoorwill. And um, the Bob White and the whippoorwill have something in common, especially if you're in Ohio where I'm at. The Bob White was once common here um, and when I ask people when the last time they've seen a Bob White or heard a Bob White, often they'll tell me it's been decades, despite the fact that they were common, you know, when they used to stand at the bus stop back in the 60s and 70s. And the same with the whippoorwill, a bird you used to hear all the time, and now you don't really hear it much. I'm certain you all know what those are. <laughs> Lightning bugs, fireflies. Um, <laughs> uh, fireflies can be found in 49 of the 50 states. Uh, every state except Hawaii. A lot of people out west say they don't have fireflies, um, but that's not true. The fireflies out there just don't tend to glow in the night. Uh, a lot of them will glow during the day. And so 49 states have them, um, but 18 species of firefly face extinction and just in the U.S. alone. And their numbers are uh, declining drastically. 
And I'm certain you all know what that is. Monarch, monarch, monarch or a viceroy. Yeah, ah, that's that's a monarch. For whoever said a viceroy, you are educated there. Um, a lot of people don't know the difference. They look very similar, but mm -hmm. usually on the bottom part of the wing, there's an extra black line that goes horizontal, and they're a little smaller. Um, and those are your viceroys. But this is a monarch on a New England aster. Um, monarchs are endangered species now. Um, some <laughs> estimates have it as high as there being 98 fewer for every 100 that there used to be oh, just yeah. decades ago. So for every 100 used to have, in some instances, now you have as few as two. <laughs> and so why is all this happening? And what are some other examples? They're not isolated. Um, One million species face extinction. 40% of all plants face extinction. And I often, a lot of people don't think about plant extinction. We often think about, you know, mammalian extinction or avian extinction, but um, we see this a lot. Uh, you know, you're in um, uh, the East Coast. So think about the chestnut, the American chestnut. Um, that was a tree that was once 25% of the deciduous forest of the East Coast. It's now all but functionally extinct. Um, it There are very, very tiny remnant populations and scientists do not tell people where they're at for a reason. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and then think about other species, you know, elm trees with the Dutch elm disease. Um, another tree a lot of people don't think of that's kind of going away slowly is the beech tree. Beech yeah. trees are declining, ash trees, emerald ash borer. And so those are just trees, um, but there's a lot of other uh, plant species that are just like that who are declining. And we have 3 billion fewer birds uh, in North America than just 50 years ago, 3 billion. And um, that is actually, we're talking about scales that maybe people on this talk know. If you're 60, 70 years old, you can think about 50 years ago. But if you were to even go back, like say 150 years ago, we would have had the passenger pigeon, uh, mm -hmm. which was the most numerous bird in the entire world. Um, there were billions of passenger pigeons and we made them extinct uh, through a lot of hunting and habitat loss. And so think if we would go back, you know, 150 years, not only would we have 3 billion fewer birds, we'd have six, seven, eight billion fewer birds than just, you know, 150 years ago. And many species have already gone extinct. And so this one right here, by the way, is Bachman's warbler. Bachman's warbler was last seen in the 1980s and was officially declared extinct in um, 2023 last year. It liked uh, its preferred habitat was the swampy bottomland forest of the southeast. It was migratory out of the Bahamas area in Cuba. It would come up to the southeast of the country and hang out in the bottomland forest to migrate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, habitat loss, it went extinct. Um, mm -hmm. It liked the same habitat as the ivory-billed woodpecker, which was the largest woodpecker that ever lived, and the last one was seen in the 1940s. So these species on this page right here are all the species that were declared extinct in the U.S. just last year. Mm -hmm. uh, so 23 mm -hmm. species. Wow. Um, you'll notice a lot of them in the top left are probably words you don't know how to say. And guess what? I don't know how to either. Uh, that's because they're Hawaiian. Um, Hawaii, if you were unaware, is considered the extinction capital of the world. Um, it is uh, quite a sad place to visit if you know what you're looking at. It is heavily invaded by invasive species. There's been tremendous habitat loss. Uh, everywhere you look, species are in radical decline and on the brink of extinction. They have numerous birds uh, nearing extinction right now. Um, Bachman's warblers on this list, as I mentioned. Uh, and then I always like the Scioto mad tom. I like to point that out when I'm talking to groups in Ohio because we're from Ohio. That was a species of catfish that was distinct in Ohio only. Um, and then the bottom right, um, if you didn't know this, here's a fun fact for you. The USA is the muscle capital of the world. We have more biodiversity and muscles than any other country in the world. Um, but we're also driving them to extinction at a rapid rate. Um, that's eight, I think, right there, or seven listed. No, the pig toe is also a muscle. So eight muscles that went extinct last year. Um, Michigan is kind of like ground zero for the biodiversity. They have 45 species, but 32 of them are endangered. So why is all this happening? Um, some people sometimes will like, well, hey, things go extinct anyways. This is a normal process. Um, but it's called the background rate is something that uh, you'll want to be concerned with here. So the background rate is the normal rate of extinction over like long periods of time, which scientists can kind of guess is between, you know, like a certain range. And it's usually X amount of species per X amount of years. And uh, 
So the problem is right now, the rate of extinction is not like, you know, two times more, three times more. It's anywhere from about 200 to 1,000 times faster than usual, um, which is incredibly fast, um, especially when you think about the fact that species evolve over, you know, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of years. Um, the average bird species, for example, lives for about two to three million years. Uh, so if it takes two to three million years for one species to evolve and pass away, and they're suddenly going extinct 200 to 1,000 times faster, that's a problem. And so why is this happening? There was this gentleman named E.O. Wilson who passed away a few years ago. E.O. Wilson was brilliant. Um, some people call him the Darwin of our time. Um, he is kind of like, he was America's David Attenborough, if you will. Um, he was an entomologist who specialized in ants. He discovered a couple hundred species of ants in his life. He wrote about 29 books. Um, and he was obsessed with little, little creatures like ants and all the little insects. He called them the creatures that ran the world. Um, and he always said, you know, if humans went away today, the rest of the world would be fine. But if the rest of the world went away today, humans would be done for. Um, <laughs> classic example, we need them more than they need us. He hypothesized five reasons um, why uh, species decline and go extinct. And I'll give you the acronym at the end here. The first is habitat loss. Habitat loss is a major driver of species loss. Um, many of the examples I gave you um, earlier are due to habitat loss. Like for example, the uh, Bob White is a phenomenal example of habitat loss. Bachman's warbler and the ivory billed woodpecker habitat loss. I is invasive species. Uh, invasive species are a major problem, especially in places like Hawaii. Uh, many of the birds going extinct in Hawaii are due to avian malaria um, because those species of birds evolved there over five to seven million uh, years and they did so without mosquitoes. But the Europeans brought mosquitoes in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. With them, they brought avian malaria, which the birds had never evolved with, and it has wrecked the bird species there. And the problem is, is as the climate changes and the temperatures get warmer, the mosquitoes are going higher up the mountains in Hawaii. And so the birds that were even safe at higher elevations are no longer safe. So that's another example of invasive species, or I mentioned the mussels on the previous page, eight mussels. Many of y'all have probably heard of zebra mussels introduced out of Europe. They take over uh, whole bottomlands of, you know, lakes and streams and whatnot, and they displace all the native mussels. So those are a few examples of invasives, or you might know in the plant world, honeysuckle, Bradford mm -hmm. pears, burning bush, garlic mustard, uh, lesser celandine, um, all examples of invasive plants. Population, human population growth is obviously, uh, takes a huge toll on all the other biodiversity. Pollution. Pollution can be both be in the forms of air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution, and overharvesting of resources. And this could just be, you know, like the passenger pigeon. We hunted them to extinction. People used to kill them literally uh, in the tens and hundreds of thousands in one go. Uh, so these five together, the acronym is HIPPO, um, is how you can remember that. And we, uh, homegrown, focus on habitat loss and invasive species. And I want to point out, by the way, too, you might notice in this list, climate change is not there. If the climate crises was solved today, the biodiversity crises would still be raging. Um, the climate crises just exacerbates uh, and it amplifies these five features right here. Like I mentioned, the invasive species uh, on Hawaii with the avian malaria, climate change is exacerbating that problem because the malaria can now go higher up the mountains with the mosquitoes. Uh, so not a main driver, but it really does not help any of these. So this is what a biodiversity crisis looks like. To many people before, maybe you've heard this talk or aren't aware of a biodiversity crisis, these, this looks like a very lovely neighborhood. But if you know what you're looking at, this looks like an ecological desert. Nothing is alive here. Nothing can really live here. There are almost no trees. There's turf lawn, which is not native to the United States. It's native to Europe, despite the fancy names like Kentucky fescue. Kentucky fescue is not from Kentucky. It's from Europe. Um, and this is what a biodiversity crisis looks like. This is uh, the infamous Bradford pear, which I'm quite confident is as problematic for you all uh, as it is for us here in Southwest Ohio. And so 
we have to have a new approach to conservation and we have to give up the idea that humans cannot exist with nature. Um, we have to coexist with nature. It's really our only option at this point. Um, by the way, a lot of these slides, like the images are from my boss, who's an entomologist, and I am not an entomologist, um, nor am I an ornithologist or a biologist or an ecologist. I am not an ologist. So <laughs> I am a, uh, I tell people I'm a nonprofit professional. Um, I'm running a nonprofit and I just really, really, really like biodiversity. Uh, so I can struggle sometimes with the species. This I believe is an evening primrose moth. And if you want evening primrose moths on your property and you want to see evening primrose moths, you should probably plant evening primrose because that's where you'll find an evening primrose moth. <laughs> this is a zebra moth. I can't tell you what, uh, what plant they like. Um, so not only is living with nature an option, it's it's really our only option left. Like E.O. Wilson said, you know, the little creatures that run the world, we without them, we couldn't survive. And so the big problem here is the conservationists in the past would work where humans are. And if you look back to the, the early days of conservation, you know, take it back to like Teddy Roosevelt and stuff, you know, 100, 120 years ago, they were focusing on these big tracts of land where people weren't like out West. This is why we see so much more land out West in conservation than we do in the East. But now people are everywhere, everywhere. East of the Mississippi, about 80 to 85% of the land is privately owned. It's hard to probably find a place near you where people aren't. Even when it seems desolate, the land is owned, accounted for, farmed, roads are passing through it. The land is privately owned. So we don't have the ability anymore to say, let's set aside 100,000 acres here in Southeast Pennsylvania and restore the Bob Whites because there's not that much land left. So we have to focus where people are. And we have to find ways for nature to thrive in these human dominated landscapes. If you think back to the image I just showed you of suburbia and um, all those houses, nature's not thriving in that human dominated landscape. The only thing thriving in there may be some robins or some squirrels, species that we would generally call generalist species mm -hmm. that do well in general environments uh, across the board. This is, a, I don't know, Prometheus moth. Um, I really like this quote. Many of y'all are probably familiar with Rachel Carson. Um, she was kind of, you know, call her the, uh, at this point, maybe the grandmother of mm -hmm. the conservation movement, the modern conservation movement. She's most famous for her work, Silent Spring, that she wrote in the 1960s, a manifesto documenting um, the poisoning of our, our airs, our waters, our soils, and the damage it was doing. She said, in nature, nothing exists alone, but man is a part of nature, and his war against nature is inevitably a war against himself. And I always try to remember that. So if you breathe, you need biodiversity. And if you live on this planet, you need biodiversity. And if you're unfamiliar with the term biodiversity, if that's a new term to you, it's just biological diversity. It's, it's all the birds, it's all the caterpillars, the moss, the butterflies, the bees, the ones you don't like, the ones you do like, the wasps, the plants, that's biodiversity. So how we landscape, given that 85 percent of land is privately owned, determines whether we're supporting pollinators or eliminating the resources they need. This is a rusty patch bumblebee. It used to be very common all the way from where you are through where I'm at all the way up to Wisconsin. Um, I mean, it would have been a very common bumblebee. It's now critically endangered. Um, there are very few populations of them left and uh, they're on their way out if we don't act. How we, land, how we landscape determines how much carbon our property pools from the atmosphere and stores and plants in the soil. Uh, if you would, if you think about, you know, where I live in Ohio, 95% of Ohio would have been forested before human settlement. Um, and now it's croplands and houses and cities. And you look at like this big white oak and think how much carbon that white oak is holding inside of it and how much it's not holding now that we've cut them all down, we removed them. And our plant choices determine whether we harbor ecological tumors on our properties. Again, that's the Bradford pear that a lot of people didn't know better at the time. And that's what Bradford pears look like now. They've taken over and they form, if you've ever gone into one of these thickets, I was cutting down in a thicket the other day, I cut about 30 of them down. They form such dense colonies, no other native trees can come through. 
no oaks, no sweet gums, no maples, no viburnums, no dogwoods, nothing. It's only Bradford pears. And so you got to remember that too, because I, where I live, burning bush, a lot of people think it's not that invasive. And I could take people into the forest across the street from my house and I can show you burning bush growing in the forest. And they didn't plant it there, but birds don't know property boundaries. So the amount of lawn we have determines whether rain infiltrates our soils and stays or it leaves a stormwater runoff, which you know is a major problem in communities. And it determines whether we're adding nitrogen and phosphorus and herbicides and insecticides to local watershed. The other day on my run, on my little two mile loop around the neighborhood, I saw seven people spraying chemicals on their lawns. And they had to put signs on the lawn that said, stay off and it had a picture of a child with a dog holding the hand of an adult. And I was like, wow, that's very interesting. We're paying people to poison our lawns and it's so bad that they tell you, you can't walk on it. And then it rained like four hours later. And I was like, oh, that's really great. That's all just gonna end up in our watersheds. And then how much carbon you add to the atmosphere every time you mow, because if you have a bunch of trees and native flowers and stuff, you know, you're not mowing as much, they're holding that carbon. And so how you landscape determines mm -hmm. whether you're using plants that host the insects that support food webs or not. And this is a wide-eyed vireo. You have these, uh, they're a migratory bird species. So you'll see them here in a few weeks. If you're looking, they're very beautiful. And that white eye is very distinct. And this is the crux of our talk, because as we're talking about, okay, you know, you need to have less lawn and the, there's a biodiversity crisis. This is where it comes together is native plants. Native plants have co-evolved with insects to uh, have relationships that demand one another. You can't have one without the other, or if you do have one without the other, one will go away. And so 90% um, of insects have co-evolved with the species. And if you didn't know this, you probably did know it and you just didn't know you knew this. Uh, think about the most famous example. I used the image earlier of a monarch. And I bet you right now, if I asked you, a lot of y'all are going to get this. What do you plant if you want to help monarchs? And there you go. See, you already knew co-evolution. So you, you don't even need me. Um, so monarchs are actually one of about 12 species of Lepidoptera. Lepidoptera being moths and butterflies that have evolved to evade the defenses of milkweed. Most plants do not want to be eaten alive. Um, so they developed either physical or chemical defenses to avoid predation. Um, and then most insects do want to eat plants. And so they work hard to evolve to get around these things. And so milkweed, next time you see one, break open its stem or its leaf and it will secrete a white substance. Mm -hmm. That acts as a glue. It will glue the mouth shut and kill almost every insect that attempts to eat it. Mm -hmm. Except for monarchs and the other species of Lepidoptera, like the dozen or so of them that evolved uh, a workaround for this. And so I'll see people say, well, my monarchs come to my invasive butterfly bushes. It's, they're clearly helping the butterflies. And I go, well, that's just pollen. That's like, you know, you going to McDonald's. Um, but if you have babies, you're not going to feed them McDonald's. Um, you need to feed them what they need. In the case of monarchs, it's milkweed. They will only lay their eggs on the milkweed. Uh, no other plant. You'll never see a monarch lay its eggs on an aster or a goldenrod or an oak tree. It just will not happen. So now take that and remember 90% of species have co-evolved with, you know, certain plants. And therein lies the issue. We are not planting the things that these insects need, these caterpillars need. We have these big turf lawns that no caterpillars can use. We have these invasive Bradford pears that no caterpillars can use. Um, Doug has done this on his property. Uh, he's gone and checked a white oak and checked his neighbor's Bradford pear. And he'll search for a certain amount of time. I think his record on a Bradford pear is like five caterpillars and it's usually from one species. Um, and he'll usually find a couple hundred caterpillars at least on the white oak from like dozens of species. And so white oak can support 900 species of caterpillars and Bradford pears can support less than five species of Bradford pears. So now imagine you have that big turf lawn. I don't know your church, but imagine your tur church has this big turf lawn or your, your home has this big turf lawn and you have some invasive burning bushes and a Bradford pear and some daffodils and tulips. So you have nothing that's native. Um, and now 
a bird wants to nest on your property. Well, let's like take, for example, the chickadee, the Carolina chickadee, which y'all are probably quite familiar with. Uh, for its endearing little chickadee dee dee calls, which if you didn't know, by the way, that's an alarm call. Uh, they usually travel in mixed flocks. And so when you hear chickadee dee dee, the more dees, the more the alarm. And so <laughs> they're sounding the alarm for other birds. Um, but endearing they are. When a chickadee is raising a brood, they will feed them four to 700 caterpillars a day. And they will do that for 16 to 18 days. And so they need 6,000 to 9,000 or so caterpillars. But here's the catch. They can only travel in an area of about two acres, two acres. So maybe some of y'all in here have a property that's about two acres. Maybe your church property is about two acres. Try to visualize as best you can two acres. And you're a chickadee and you have to go get caterpillars five, 600 times a day. And you need to do this 16 to 18 days in a row. But if we could think back to that a picture I showed in the beginning with the big turf lawn and, you know, the Bradford pears, where is that chickadee finding food? Where is it finding these caterpillars to raise one brood, one Carolina chickadee brood in a single yard that's filled with Bradford pears and burning bushes and turf lawns sustain a single pair of chickadees? Now you multiply that out over all the yards of America, all the big church lawns of America, and you start to realize why we have a problem and why we have 3 billion birds. It's like if you went to the grocery store and there just wasn't a lot of food. And a lot of the food that they did have is food you can't eat. Like instead of like lettuce, it would be poison ivy. And they're like, well, it's just leaves, just eat them. And you're like, well, I, I, I can't do that. Of course I can't do that. That'll poison me. And they're like, well, it's just, just eat it. It's fine. Just figure it out. It's the same thing when we throw a Bradford paranoia, the bird's looking at it and he goes, I can't do anything with this. The caterpillar goes, I can't do anything with this. It doesn't complete the food webs necessary. And I always tell people, if I had to feed my two children 500 to 700 times a day for 16 to 18 days, I would move into Kroger. I would just live in the Kroger. <laughs> so that's what we have to do. We have to build Krogers for these birds and build Krogers for these caterpillars and these insects where we live, where we work, where we play and where we pray. And if we're not doing that, we're not supporting the food webs uh, that are responsible for biodiversity. And so in how we landscape and how much lawn we have and how we plant and our plant choices determine how much life earth can sustain and you know, I know y'all know this, um, but there is so much alignment with the scripture um, and us being stewards of his creation. Um, and I, I went and grabbed a few of these really quick. Um, Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And so we are we are here to take care of the Lord's creation. And I don't think we are taking care of it when we destroy its biodiversity, when we put in these big turf lawns and all the beauty of the Lord's creation can't live and survive and it's going away. I don't think that's being good stewards. And then Psalm 24, one through two, um, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world for he found upon, founded upon it uh, in the seas and established it upon the waters. So this is the Lord's. And um, I, I know I'm probably preaching to the crier, when I, I say that to you all, but y'all know that this is, we are commanded to take care of what is his. And so what an awesome responsibility you have, you know, the Lord commanding you to take care of his creation and we have a crisis and you now have the knowledge of what we can do. Um, so we at Homegrown National Park are all about building homegrown national parks. You don't have to go to national parks and state parks and local parks, which by the way, you should, they're wonderful, but you can build a park where you live, where you work, where you play and where you pray. And you can bring back biodiversity where you are um, as Doug's first book was called Bringing Nature Home. So we can bring nature home and uh, you don't have to have experience. You don't need to be a master gardener or anything like that to get started. And so property owners are the hope and future of conservation, as I mentioned, with so much land being privately owned, it is up to us to solve this. And so we gotta, uh, one day, one day, I always forget to change that, start a new habitat. Ugh. So start a new habitat. We have to start a new habitat. Um, and this bird, by the way, endearing little bird, this is a uh, 
yellow rumped warbler. Um, they're year round here in Ohio, like the only warbler I know that hangs out year round here. But birders like myself affectionately call them butter butts because if they turn yeah. around, <laughs> the little back of their butt is yellow. Yeah, and so um, this is a juvenile and we've had one in our yard every day right now. And it's really been fun to watch because he's maturing and he's getting into his breeding plumage. And I've never gotten to see this transition every day. Like the black you see on his chest is coming in much more full and his head is darkening and they become black and white with the side trim of yellow and still the yellow butt. Um, <laughs> it's just been a privilege to watch the, um, the changing plumage as he gets ready for breeding season. And so our mission at Homegrown is to motivate people everywhere to regenerate biodiversity by planting native plants and removing the invasive ones and ultimately to reshape our relationship with nature in the like spirit of Rachel Carson. We can't be at war with nature because ultimately it's a war against ourselves. So we lose every year in the United States about 800,000 acres of habitat. And we know that this, what we're offering and what we're encouraging people to do is the fastest way to solve this crisis. If we're waiting on, you know, the government to act, whether it's the local, state, or federal, which they're doing great things, but they can't act fast enough to offset this, but individual action can. And so what we need uh, is for our properties to do four things. If your property looks like this, it's not doing these four things. It needs to support the food webs we just discussed. It has to sequester the carbon. Um, it needs to clean and manage our storm water instead of just running off with all those herbicides and fertilizers into our watersheds. And it's got to support pollinators. Um, the world is losing, I didn't mention it, by the way, either uh, insects at an alarming rate. Um, insect populations are crashing. I, I specifically mentioned the firefly. The firefly is not unique. Um, whippoorwills, as I mentioned earlier, one of the driving reasons why they think they're declining is insect loss. Um, they are heavy insect feeders and it's becoming harder and harder for them to find the insects they need to survive. And so lawn accomplishes none of those goals. Like I said, like when you look at this, I don't see beauty here. I just see sadness. I see emptiness. Um, I don't see, you know, the Lord's creation at work. This was not what was created for us. And the sad thing and the reality is candidly is most people have these and they're just status symbols. They do not use them. They just mow them and they mow them often just to keep up with the Joneses. Um, I don't know. I think about my neighbors and I'm not trying to, you know, talk negatively of them, but I've been here six years now and I've run the two mile loop. Oh gosh. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And um, I don't think I've ever seen a party in one of their yards and all the yards near me are two to five acres. I don't think I've seen a family get together. I don't think I've seen a game of football or soccer or Frisbee. I have never seen someone throwing the Frisbee to the dog. Um, they just have them and yeah. they just owe them. And uh, it's because we're kind of conditioned as a society that this is success. But if you actually want to go back into the fun history of it, it comes out of the French and English aristocracies in the, you know, the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. If you were rich, affluent, you could have a lawn because it was the ultimate flex. Like I have so much land and so much money that I can pay people to maintain my land to do nothing. Um, so it was a big status symbol. Um, and, and then the foreign plants thing, how we're so excited about exotic plants, same thing. You know, if you were living in, you know, think 1850s France or the US, you did not have foreign plants. Um, what you did have were the plants that were local to you, but the people who were rich could afford, look at my plant in China. And so that's where that culture kind of came from. And then it became accessible to the masses in the mid 20th century. And that is when it really rapidly began. And thanks to people like Scott's uh, fertilizers and mm -hmm. some really good ad campaigns, we are now culturally conditioned to do this. And so can we do this? Can we restore biodiversity? Can we reduce our lawns? Obviously, of course we can do this. It's very easy. Um, and you don't have to do it for a full uh, living like I do. Um, no one's requiring that. You can just save it where you live and where you work, um, where you play, where you pray. And uh, this is a prairie warbler, by the way. Prairie warblers are beautiful migratory birds. So I saw my first one last May. Um, so we tell people to focus on the biodiversity crises 
really where you live first. Um, but in your case, as a church group, we would love to see you also focus on it on your church campus. Um, this is a complex problem. It's a big problem. Um, but the nice thing about this problem is your actions on an individual level on your property and at your church actually make a difference. And you just have to trust that everybody's working on this quilt, but everybody's just working on their square. So you have to work on your square of the quilt. Um, you know, there's some other problems that are really tough, like how does your church save the whales? That's a very tough problem to solve um, as a church group in Pennsylvania. But if I tell you to solve the biodiversity crises at your church, you can do it. You can remove the invasive species off your property. You all can install a prairie. You all can plant trees that are native, like oaks and, like I said, the sweet gums. And, oh, I don't know, I've planted so many trees, I forget all the species. Um, you can build that habitat and restore that habitat, and you'll watch it work. And so, again, yeah, what can one person do? We can shrink our lawns. We can add pollinator gardens, remove invasives, um, keystone plants. I'll talk about that in a sec. We can turn off our lights at night. Uh, light pollution is a terrible, terrible driver of insect loss. Um, it disorients. Uh, you've seen moss. They get stuck in patterns. They don't know why they get stuck. They just know their head bends back towards the light, and they can't break away from it. And they'll fly and fly and fly and fly and fly, and then they ultimately die. Um, so we can turn off our lights at night. Um, you definitely want to get rid of your mosquito fogger if you have one. Um, there's no such thing as a, a mosquito spray that kills mosquitoes. What does exist is a spray that kills everything. Um, it is effectively an insect genocide when we use mosquito foggers. The monarchs will be killed. The fireflies will be killed. The luna moss will be killed. Everything will be killed. Um, it takes uh, no prisoners, only victims. Um, and then I'll explain a little more uh, in a sec, the HNP biodiversity map. But I want to go back to keystone plants. If y'all walk away from this today and you want to do even one thing, we want you to at least plant one plant. Um, it's, a, it's a small ask. And if you're going to plant one plant, we encourage you to plant keystone plants. Keystone plants, the concept comes from like the arch, the, the keystone of an arch, that top stone. And if you pulled out the keystone, the arch collapses. Well, in the natural world, keystone species, they can be both plants, they can be animals, they're species of outsized importance. When you take it out of that ecosystem, the ecosystem collapses or it really starts to suffer and hurt. And so we've identified plants that are called keystones that support a lot of life. The granddaddy of them all, uh, where we live is the white oak. The white oak is just the champion. It wins every time. It can support so many species of insects. But there are lots of other ones. Yours are going to be slightly different than mine. Um, Y'all are probably, you know, mid-Atlantic, Atlantic highlands, whereas I'm, um, I think they call it like eastern deciduous forest. But it's going to be your hickories. It's going to be your oaks. It's going to be, you know, tends to be dogwoods and viburnums. Um, black cherries, uh, things in the prunus family. So black cherries and American plums. So those would be like in your trees, in your flowers, it's gonna be things like helianthus, which is your sunflowers, anything in the sunflower family, any of your asters or your goldenrods. Um, I'm not sure if it's native where y'all are at. You're, you're a little far from me. It might be purple coneflower, echinacea is a keystone species. And so, there's these list of keystone plants. And it's like, if you're just going to do one, like go for a keystone. Like if you're going to plant one tree and you've got space for it, go for the, go for the white oak because it, it's just the champion. It's going to support, I think of them like bird feeders. If you want birds to come to your yard, you can put out bird feeders. But when you plant a Bradford pear, an invasive Bradford pear, it's like putting out an empty bird feeder and it's just going to stay empty. But when you put out a white oak, it's like a bird feeder that's going to stay full always for hundreds of years. And so that's what you think. You got to plant bird feeders. Um, and I say bird feeders, it's not like we're not, I'm not here to try to get you more birds. Uh, I'd love for you to have more birds, but it's just a really nice visual representation of, is this tree going to be a full bird feeder for me? Or is it just going to be an empty one, like a Bradford pear? And so, and once you do that, we want you to get on our biodiversity map, which is a very simple map. We actually have it to where you can make organizational accounts like your church and you all as individuals, when you plant you can get on and associate with your church and so if you go and plant a hundred square foot garden of native plants we want that added to our list um, so far we've had thirty-eight thousand people in three years get on and whoever stored a hundred thousand acres of habitat 
Um, and that's why we know this is the fastest solution because 38,000 individuals just like you who cared and wanted to make a difference did. And they restored 100,000 acres of land through plantings and removing invasives. And so it's easy. You can find it on our website. It's pretty easy to run through. And if you have issues, you can let us know. We'll help you. And so, again, I, I say this out of order. One plant can make a difference. Keystone plants are the backbone. Um, so definitely consider planting them. That's lance leaf coreopsis, by the way, I think, maybe on the top. Uh, and then, as I also mentioned, when you do this, it shrinks the problem down to something manageable. You just can't worry about everything else. You know, it breaks my heart when I drive and I see invasive species yesterday driving by a river. I looked at the forest floor and it was all lesser celandine. The entire thing was lesser celandine. It just, there are no native ephemerals left in this forest I drove by. It hurt me, but I can only focus on what I can focus on, which is my property. And on my property, I've put in 30,000 feet, square feet of wildflowers. I've planted 100 plus native trees and shrubs. Added another one yesterday, another buckeye tree. Um, mm -hmm. I can control what I can control. And that's the thing. You can control what you can control on your properties and at your church. This is a black-throated green warbler, migratory as well. So here's our call to action. We want y'all to regenerate habitat. Uh, we want you to join our movement. Uh, in this case, your, your church. Um, we'd love to have your church on the map. We have churches already on our map. Uh, we have cities on our map, uh, businesses on our map. One near y'all, Teva Pharmaceuticals is on our map. So we have corporations getting involved. Um, we want um, people to partner with us. And uh, very candidly, we are a nonprofit. Um, we are fully 100% donor driven. Um, no federal, state, government grants or anything like that. We um, can only do what we do thanks to the generosity of individuals like you all who care and who want to see biodiversity restored. And that's how we reach people. I'm actually the only employee of Homegrown National Park. We're relatively small, <laughs> uh, team of one. Otherwise, you know, I would probably be like, ask a teammate, like, it's a Sunday talk, save me. Uh, but, uh, 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 Suggest, uh, but we're 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 trying to grow, uh, and we can only grow through the generosity of people like you all. And that's a beautiful picture, by the way. the The tall flower he's standing by is wild bergamot, um, and I love wild bergamot. If you've ever seen it in the wild, uh, it's like the bergamot of tea that you're thinking of, and it's uh, hummingbird clear wing moths. Love it, and I had always only ever seen hummingbird clear wing moths. They're these big moths with wings that are translucent, and they kind of look like hummingbirds. A lot of people mistake them for hummingbirds, and I only ever saw them at the wetland. And then we planted bergamot, and in the first year, guess what I saw on our property? Hummingbird clear wing moths. It happens every time. If you plant it, they'll come. We've had 75 species of birds visit our property now. Last year, we had indigo bunting hanging out in our prairie. We had, you know, goldfinches nesting in the goldenrods. Right now, I told you it was our first year, we have a warbler nesting in the yard. Uh, my bluebirds are nesting right now. Their eggs hatched yesterday. It was their first brood of the year, but they've had 10 broods in four years now. Um, we built it and they've come. So how we act now is going to determine nature's fate. That's a Northern Cardinal and ultimately our own. And I want to end on one last story. That's Hunter. Y'all probably saw him earlier in the talk. Um, that little ham uh, in this photo was a year old, and that's my wife, Dr. Huff. Um, this was taken uh, at Diamond Head uh, in Hawaii last March. Um, my wife, uh, you know, had to go to a conference, and I was like, fine, I'll come. Um, <laughs> and it was very selfless of me. Um, so, <laughs> I joined her for two weeks. Uh, the conference was like five days. Uh, and so for five days was probably one of the best five days of my life. It was just me and Hunter. Uh, I took him every day to, you know, the aquarium, to the zoo, to the beach. Um, I just had so much fun. I carry him like that on my back almost every day. Uh, I'll take him, I'm going to a park today with him. Uh, he still sits on my back. And when I told my wife, I join her um, when the conference was over, we left Hawaii or Hilo or sorry, we were in uh, Honolulu. We went to the big island for a week. And I told her while we were there, I want to see one bird. I want to see a palila. Um, I'm a big birder. I've seen 404 species of birds now, which may sound like a lot to you, but there's 11,000 in the world. So I've seen less than 4%. Mm. And um, as I mentioned, Hawaii is the extinction capital of the world. And I said, I want to see a bird, a palila. Palilas are in the honey creeper family. Um, honey creepers are incredible. Most people think about evolution and they um, 
will often tell you about Darwin's finches, the birds that showed up in the Galapagos. And uh, what happens is one species will show up and go, huh, no one else is here. And there's all these food options. And over time, one subset of the birds will start to eat something and it'll kind of evolve towards that. And it's what we call ecological niches. Species evolve through ecological niches. They fill the gaps of ecological niches. If something is not using something, something else will usually come in and evolve into that ecological niche. And it's not an intentional process. The bird does not go, I am going to do this. But over, you know, generation after generation, it happens. And so finches showed up in Hawaii about five to seven million years ago. And the process of rapidly evolving into many different species is called adaptive radiation. And the finches evolved into the honey creepers. And there were dozens of honey creeper species because no other birds had yet made it to Hawaii. Because think of the odds of making it to Hawaii. It's in the middle of nowhere. They were probably completely lost at sea during a hurricane or a tsunami. Land and they're like, wow, we struck gold. And so unfortunately now though, um, over 70 species of birds have gone extinct in Hawaii since humans showed up. It began with the Polynesians in the 1200s. 50 species of birds were extinct by the time the Europeans have showed up and they brought a few extra diseases and things with them. They've added an extra 20 species that have now gone extinct. The Palila is one of those that's critically endangered. It used to be found on multiple islands. It is now only found on the big island. It is only found in an area the size of nine square miles so three miles by three miles on the slopes of Mauna Kea above a certain altitude at 4,000 feet and only where there's one tree, the Mamane tree, which is the shrubby little tree around me. Um, so I'm on the big island right here. And in the distance over my head is uh, Kilauea, the volcano over on Oahu. And um, I went looking for the Palila three times, um, twice with my wife and son. Um, for three different hours over two days. And then um, the, the second to last night we were there, I asked my wife if she would mind if I woke up the next morning long before sunrise. I drove the two hours to this remote place. It's in the middle of nowhere up a four by four road, dirt road to go look. And I got there at sunrise and I spent two hours looking and I never heard a Palila, never saw one. Um, there's only about 700 left in the wild. Uh, their numbers continue to crash and uh, as I got back in the car to leave, I remember crying on the drive back to where we were staying. And it wasn't because I didn't see a Palila. Um, as much as I would like to have seen one and added it to my life list, um, that's okay. Um, that's, that's birding. That's what happens. You go to see a bird. Sometimes you don't always see the bird. Um, what made me sad was that it pretty much meant my son would never get to see a Palila. Um, if I didn't get to see a Palila at age, you know, 33 spending three days over five hours looking for it as their numbers crash and there's only 700 left in the wild it pretty much means hunter will never see one in the wild he probably will see one in the zoo like the san diego zoo where they'll keep the species alive but barely and um that's not okay with me i don't think that's fair um extinction is permanent and extinction is not something that's us playing god when we choose to make species go extinct through our own individual actions. And it's taking something um, from others that we don't have permission to take. I don't have permission for my son to take Palilas from him. Even if he grows up and does not care about Palilas, doesn't care about birds, that's his decision to make. It's not my decision to make. It's not your decision to make. Um, we owe it to our children, to our grandchildren, and to future generations to have all the biodiversity that we know and love. Um, it's up to them to be able to choose whether they want to see it or love it. Um, it's certainly not up to us. So we have an obligation. Um, scripture tells us so, and we have a moral obligation to ensure that Hunter and now Lark, my daughter, can go find a Palila in the future. And uh, that's my wife. And that's my son looking for birds uh, a few months ago up in Boston at a wildlife refuge. So yeah, that's my talk. So thank y'all. Brandon, you said you were kind enough to answer any questions that uh, absolutely. So I'm going to throw it out to you guys, Lori. I, I just wanted to say thank you for your talk, and um, I've 
actually been teaching these principles for the last 40 years. Um, I was at the first conference where Dr. Talame actually talked about his research he hadn't published yet. So your talk has not gone unheard because I'm on the Care for Creation Committee. I've done this on my own property. And um, we're gonna have a table next uh, on Earth Day where I'll be talking about these issues. So it hasn't been in vain. I thank you very much for doing what you're doing. Thank you. And I know, um, I, I don't wanna sound, I hope I don't sound, um, especially I end on that note about the Palila um, negative. There is so much hope in this movement. Um, I get asked all the time, I was at a woman's house the other day cutting honeysuckle down for her. And she said, does it matter? And she's like, is it, is it working? I was like, yeah, 38,000 people have restored 100,000 acres in three years. Um, these efforts matter. And it's, I, I think of it, um, the movement's nascent. It's young. We're just a young movement. But, you know, if you've been doing this 40 years, you know, how did you find native plants 40 years ago? It was yeah. very hard. And when I started, you went on the Audubon Society and all the plants they listed were non-native. Exactly. It's, you know, I mean, really back then and now it's very different. So very different. there has and been cities, some change, but not enough. Yeah. And cities are at least becoming aware and states are banning species not fast enough. But, you know, nowadays we have native nurseries. There are so many native nurseries now coming along and we have native plant sales all the time. My Audubon's doing one next week with 10,000 native plants going to be there. Um, it's happening. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a wonderful time. And again, the, we think of this as such a great opportunity to grow the movement. You're joining the movement while it's young and really picking up steam. Um, so if you've been doing it 40 years, I won't tell you, oh, I kind of told you how old I was. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's exciting. Uh, we have another question back here. Um, one of our primary challenges in planting anything is the deer who were there before we were. Um, so they do not eat daffodils. Yep. I never thought about it being invasive. Obviously, they are. Oh, by the way, I, I, they're not. They're just non-native. Um, all mm -hmm. invasives are non-native. Not all non-natives are invasive. And okay. we're not an all-or-nothing movement. I really should have said that, by the way. You can well, still have grass lawn. You can have <laughs> daffodils and tulips. I'm I have lilacs. I'm not taking out um, my daffodils. But yeah, no, you're good. I'm taking out my daffodils if I wanted to. Um, but I wondered of the, particularly the tree species that you mentioned, Oh, we do our part on our three quarter acres. We have maybe, I don't know how much. We have a biodiverse green out front. It is not turf. Um, but in the back, we have woods. Are there trees that we could plant that the deer won't graze off when they're sap? Yeah, that's a really tough question. Um, deer are. That's my teacher. <laughs> deer are actually a species of concern um, because they are native. But the problem is, we've gotten things so out of balance that deer populations are massive compared to what they would have been pre-human settlement because one of the things we've done is we've taken out all the apex predators. Wow. So if you would think back a few hundred years ago, like where I lived, there was bison roaming through Ohio, which is like crazy for me to think about. You would have had lynxes and bobcats and like all these, you know, more north you have wolverines and at way higher levels. These kept deer populations in check. And, and then when you also had 95% of Ohio was forest and smaller deer populations, and now you have very mm -hmm. little Ohio is forest and big deer populations, you run into this problem um, she's mentioning where deer chew on everything. And it's actually a very, very serious problem in some places. They estimate like in New York that 70% of the, spe or the forest are dying. And mm -hmm. people will walk in and go, oh, well, this is a healthy forest. It looks great. But if you don't know what you're looking at, it looks like that. But if you do know what you're looking at, you realize there are no new trees. All the trees are a lot older and there's no new generation of trees replacing them. So there are some species where you can like, you know, like if it has a physical protection, like say like a honey locust, uh, the thorns of a honey locust or where I'm at, you also have... Um, Osage orange uh, mm -hmm. that will resist them because of the uh, um, the thorns or like another good example like that would be your American holly. Um, they don't also tend to like the birches and the aspens, um, but really the best way to do it and it's kind of a pain is to just build those small like little enclosures with like either chicken wire kind of situation or like on the military base near me they actually <laughs> five six foot tall tubes that are yeah. like 
greenish and they have little like surfaces poked into them so light and air can get in and the tree will start growing through that tall tube and like you'll see all the leaves in there but then eventually by the time it's five six foot it can explode out the top and it keeps the deer away mm -hmm. um so you either have to go with like a tree that has a natural physical defense like again the holly or the um honey locust or mm -hmm. something birch family or make a physical barrier yourself because it's just a real it's unfortunately a very serious problem and that's one that Longwood had last week. If you remember, he addressed that. They actually are having a, a kind of a, a small a hunt uh, in this 800 acre area because they are having significant issues with deer. It's, it's and sad to do that. It's, yeah, it's not like I, I think. And the problem is too, if you tell, if you start talking about <laughs> your numbers, a lot of people will start thinking, well, you just want to kill Bambi. And it's like, no, 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 <laughs> nobody is like advocating that. But the problem is, we have unfortunately taken the predators out of the again we took the keystone species out what we learned over the last 50 60 years is the apex predators actually keep the rest of everything in line and there is a really good book on that if you ever want to read it i thought it was a page turner uh it's called where the wild things were uh, where the wild things were um it's such a good book anyone else have a question yes yeah i, I wanted to thank you for your military service first um, and I spend a lot of time in Cape May Point and what you were talking about in terms of the monarchs, I used to see hundreds. And if I am if I'm there in September, I'm lucky if I see two or three. But the firehouse there has once a year an event where they give away to anybody in the town milkweed to plant mm -hmm. to bring them hopefully back. That's the intent. Oh. Will that help? <laughs> it's it. But that's what I was saying. Like when she when she mentioned too, she's been doing this forty years. Like you probably weren't seeing that forty years ago. And that's like that's the stuff that gives me hope. Is when a firehouse is giving stuff away, or like um, where I live, um, a lot of the soil and conservation districts do plant sales in the spring. And actually, um, Montgomery County, which is Dayton, Ohio, did theirs Thursday and Friday, and they sell trees in packs of five for ten dollars. Now they're little. They we call them whips. They're about a foot tall. Um, but I bought 15 trees for $30. Spice bush, pawpaw, and um, flowering dogwood. And so how accessible, you know, 15 trees for $30 if you have some patience. Um, and we, did, we did that last year with this group. I don't know if you remember, but we, we had um, someone who was able to get uh, free trees and the state is very much interested in supplying, you know, uh, trees from Pennsylvania. So these things are available. You just, and they were free. We were free. Yeah. We passed it on. Because it's happening. That's what gives me hope. Yeah. Go ahead. What's, what is, what are some good resources for figuring out what we should take out and what we should plant? You. Yeah, oh. that's a, um, <laughs> okay. that's such a good question. Um, for invasives, uh, Homegrown National Park doesn't maintain an invasive list, but like for you, um, it's always a good thing. You can do like invasive species, state, and then you can put the word extension in your Google search. Mm -hmm. What you'll end up with a lot of times is something like Penn State Extension Yes, will have resources. A lot of these extensions, like in, in Ohio, Ohio State Extension will have tremendous resources online. So you could Google and you'll have your invasive list present to you. I can tell you probably where you're at. It's probably the same, very similar to me. It's probably going to be Privet, Bradford Pear, Burning Bush, Lesser Celandine, Japanese Knotwood, um, Garlic Mustard, um, Winter Creeper. Um, burning which, Bush. Yeah, yeah, Burning Bush, by the way, is Euonymus. It's in the family Euonymus, and Winter Creeper is another one in the Euonymus family. So there's a lot of invasive Euonymus. There's a native one called uh, Eastern Wahoo, which is lovely and yeah. looks just like burning bush. So that's the way to figure out the invasives. And then um, natives, there's two ways. On our website, we have, um, it's called like keystone plant or trees and shrubs. And you go and you find where you're at on the map and you click it and it'll tell you what your EPA eco region is. For native plants, we don't worry about USDA hardiness zones like you do with vegetables and gardening. Um, because that's like that helps you know when to plant your carrots or your tomatoes because those are non-native species and it has to deal with freeze times. Um, eco regions are kind of like like areas where species are similar um, and local ecosystems. So it'll tell you your ecosystem when you click that map on our website and then you just scroll down 
till you find yours and it'll download a PDF file for you with all the keystone trees and shrubs for your area. Now it's not all of them. We curated the list to make sure it was the species you could also find. Um, it doesn't do us any good if we're like, hey, go, this is a great keystone. And then you call 17 nurseries and can't find it. And then same thing, we have another one called container gardening, but those are all flowers, but we call it container gardening because all of the species in there are keystones can be found uh, easily and work in containers, which is important because we have a lot of people who live in apartments, retirement communities. Um, so that's a way to find some of the keystones. But we also have a resource that says like native plant uh, databases or something. And when you click that on our website, it's actually just a list of all the websites that have really good native plant finders, such as Audubon, California Native Plant Society, or my favorite is Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. Mm -hmm. And when you're on those, you'll put like your state and you're like, well, I want um, a perennial flower uh, that's no taller than four feet and it has an orange bloom. Mm -hmm. And it'll say, here's all the species that meet that criteria for you. The mm -hmm. only downside about those is those are so holistic that you can't always find the species it's telling you about, like at a commercially cultivated level or even find seeds for. So you do have to then go a step further and try to like locate who you can get that seed from. Um, but we also have a, a resource directory where you can like zoom in and see all the nurseries around you, the native landscapers around you to help you find those uh, nurseries. Very good. Uh, anybody else just to wrap up here because I, I want to be conscious of time. Yes. I just want to I just want to thank you for sharing your 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 joy, your love, your passion, because I just so understand and believe that if we can, you know, pass that on and get people to realize that that these fellow creatures that we share our environment with, um, they need our help and we need their help. We're all in this together. We yeah, are I, we are living in their environment, and I I just yep. I just thank you for everything you've shared with us, and I think our our role is now to pass it on. Yeah. I I really appreciate that. My wife and I were sitting on our porch the other day, and the birds were singing. I I love this time of year. I'm a big runner, and uh, I always get sad in the late fall because it gets quiet. And, yes. And then sometime I'll be on a run and late February, early March, and I start to hear the song coming back. And you know, we were sitting there on the porch listening to the bird song. And I just looked at her, I said, what a sad world to never know bird song. Mm -hmm. Like imagine going through life, not recognizing bird song. Even if you don't know what the species are, that's fine. Um, but how many people don't even recognize all these amazing creatures are all around us. Mm -hmm. But once we teach people, especially our children and the children's children, um, there's a really great quote by, um, I'm going to butcher his name, Michael Pyle. Um, Michael Pyle is the founder, uh, the co-founder, I think, or founder of Xerxes Society. I think he's passed away now. Um, and Xerxes Society is all about invertebrate conservation and just a wonderful, they're named after the Xerxes blue, the only species of butterfly that's ever gone extinct in the United States. Um, he said, what is the extinction of a condor to a child who has never known a wren? Mm -hmm. And um, that has always been, ever since I read that, has been very powerful to me. Um, extinction to the average person doesn't mean anything. So what's the extinction of a condor, like a California condor, to someone who doesn't even know a wren, especially a child? So mm -hmm. we have a wonderful opportunity to share this with others and to cultivate um, a, a future generation that loves nature. Um, because if you teach a child to love something, they'll grow up to never destroy it. Um, so, but in all, again, what a great responsibility. Indeed. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, You're welcome. Yeah, I'm going to have your prayer. Yeah, let me close this in prayer. Let's pray. Creator God, we are thankful for the wonder of creation, for its biodiversity, and ask you to forgive us for the ways that we have done it harm, um, but continue to give us hope uh, and encouragement. Uh, we thank you for uh, all that Brandon has shared, um, open our minds that we can uh, gather in these ideas and the learnings that we can be part of the solution and help us to reconsider the ways that we live even on our own properties, uh, but then to share that knowledge with uh, those that we encounter, that we can continue to spread um, the wonder and awe of what you've created and how we are called to live in harmony with it. We pray all this in your name. Amen. 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 Brandon, again, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh
Lori, did you want to say something? Lori will be here next Sunday and she can help answer questions. Yeah, um, I've been teaching at Longwood Gardens for decades. I've taught dealing with deer there, so Nancy, come talk to me um, from a scientific level. If you want to know about what good plants are and you know what the invasive plants are, I'll bring information next week. Stop by where you see me. I'm happy to talk to you about it. I've done this on my property. I had uh, 300, I had three quarters of an acre, I had 325 native species. <laughs> I never needed to use insecticide because my birds took care of my insects. <laughs> what did you do with the dandelions? He found yards that had no dandelions in them at all. Well, I teach <laughs> weed science at Longwood Gardens. I'm right. their weed science person too. Um, so we can talk about that, but right now is not the- I'm not just saying, yeah. we picked yards of- But you know, purple. dandelions, Actually, some of our weeds will attract, you know, wildlife yeah. to what would otherwise be sterile yards. Right. So the question is, you know, our, in our desire for monoculture, you know, with that perfect lawn, what are we also doing? Well, we'll discuss that later on, which is curious. Yes, and, and, you know, having less lawn yards. is always a good thing, too. Right. But thank you, everybody. Anyway, I'm happy to answer the questions. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We will be sending you. Uh, we'll be sending you a check. Wonderful. And so, and I think we have your address. And yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. If I can be of service again, no. It's a wonderful starting. All this. We have a lot to do on our property here. We had a humming. And that's, I think, to one contain you were all needed to pay that dollar. So we'll be there at 6 o'clock. Wonderful. Thank you. And I look forward to stay in touch and let me know how it works goes on your property. I will. I will. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Bye. Well, I was talking about uh, Callaway's book oh, on right. Friday, so so much of this. Well, that's the time of year you need to be thinking about which book. Which one am I? It's bringing nature to such a way. Nature sets hard. Yeah, yeah. It's so, it takes it's hard to go a whole book on what you do. Yeah, I need to plant. Oh, there you go. Make sure we're not going there.